Hey, people. Some of us, we've got hands, we've got shoulders, we've got knees, and we've got toes. And sometimes a computer game's interface may allow us to use one or more of these appendages in order to control it. Sometimes this can be great. If done with appropriate technology and great enough accuracy, it can remove a layer of abstraction between you and your control over your player character, making it easier to get done what you'd like to get done in a game. However, improving the fidelity of control in a game, often it's an advantage, an upgrade, a power-up. Giving a player direct command, the ability to reach their hands right into the game world to affect their agency, unless a game is designed with this consideration, well, then it doesn't matter how cool and accurate the motion is, it makes for a bad time. Oof. I'm getting ahead of myself, bear with me for a moment. Last year I made a video highlighting a trio of key factors that, in my opinion, the complete set of made for good motion controls in a game, eventually pleading the case that the multiplayer mode of Call of Duty 4 Reflex, the Wii edition, addressed each of them and so was a great example of a well-designed motion controlled game. So let's recap. What are those three key factors? First, the main mechanics of a motion controlled game should be linked to simulative control. That's to say, the gestures and actions you perform through this interface should be translated with enough accuracy such that if you're good at the thing you're doing, you'll be good at the game you're doing it in. So if you're good at boxing, you'll be good at the simulative boxing game packaged with Wii Sports. Or rather, no, the complete opposite. Wii Sports as a whole is actually a fantastic example of the first rule being broken, but the game cheating its way almost to a point where it's acceptable. M more details in my previous video if you're interested, but notably in the boxing game it totally fails. Simply put, if you're good at boxing, you won't necessarily be good at the boxing game. That's because rather than translating your movement to approximate the moves pulled off by your character, the game actually expects very specific inputs for each type of punch. Those being only x-axis rotation, of which there are only three accepted positions, and waggle direction, of which there are only two. Now, not to toot my own horn, but sometimes I forget that I'm officially a professional at Wii Sports Boxing. Ha! <laughs> yeah, cool dude over here. So, to me it's clear why this is an issue, though to you it might not be. Let me give you an example. You ever pull off an uppercut in the game, and most importantly, mean to? Odds are, no. Because see, the gesture you typically expect to trigger an uppercut doesn't actually upper cut it. Oof. That is, unless of course, somehow, you think that pointing the remote downwards and shaking it to the side translates to the sick punch. Wii Sports Boxing is a poo-poo because the predetermined gestures it expects you to perform aren't simulative. So what's one way to fix that? Well, that happens to be our second key factor. Give the player some choice in how they'd like to control things. I mean, configurable inputs and sensitivities are the norm in most all games these days, so if you're demanding actual physical movement of a player in order to act in a game, the least you could do is allow them to define their own controls and ranges and, and whatnot. Call of Duty 4 on the Wii masters this. The oh-so-familiar button mapping screen is accessible, but interestingly, not only can buttons be mapped, but so too can gestures, controller rotations, and combinations of both. Combined with the nunchuck controller, these options allow you to fully customize your gameplay controls to your your liking, or to suit an otherwise clunky peripheral like the Wii Zapper, whose default control scheme uses a single button to throw all grenades, but depending on if you're tilting your controller to the left or to the right, will either throw out frags or flashbangs. On top of input mapping, however, the player is given a peek under the hood and the opportunity to make choices about all sorts of other things. From a fully customizable dead zone, a concept unique to motion controlled first person shooters, complete with different choices for hip aiming and, and down sights, all the way to things like sensitivity in all sorts of different states of play, or how the camera should behave when you do a certain action, or how much force should be necessary to register a waggle as a knife attack. If of course you've decided to set the knife to a waggle, there's just there's just total control over your agency in the game, and most importantly, and to COD's great benefit, all of these controls are manageable live in-game at any point. It's just, I've never played a game with such a unique set of control options that also thought them out so thoroughly and gave me complete access to its innards. Again, I go much more into this in last year's video, so check that out if you're interested, but for now, I'm skipping over. The third, and arguably most important key factor in whether or not a motion control game works well, the maker or breaker in many cases, is whether or not the game in question considers its interface. Or in other words, that the game is designed for motion controlled gameplay. 
More often than not, you'd expect to see people attribute gimmick controls with unfairness, the clunky gestures and inaccurate readings getting in the way in contrast to the certainty of a button press. But when done properly, which is what we care about, you actually have the complete opposite type of unfairness. This is what happened in Resident Evil 4 Wii Edition. Turning aiming into an analog, a continuous event, and adding special gestures for knife equipping and use, these overpowered the player in a lot of ways. They made it very easy to play Resident Evil 4 at a level that only an extremely skilled player could in the original versions. Luckily, RE4 had a dynamic difficulty system, which meant that players of the Wii version would automatically be faced with harder challenges, unintentionally balancing this out. You could certainly understand, though, how improved controls could totally ruin a game unready to handle them, designed without them in mind, and you could definitely imagine the opposite, too. While RE4's original clunky tank-style movement was only aided by motion controls, the twitchy, fast-paced action of Call of Duty was slowed down by them. Not to bore you, but the then industry standard for Wii FPS games, the Dead Zone aiming system, it meant that character rotation couldn't be instant as it was no longer coupled to aiming. That turning was now only a very deliberate action requiring a very deliberate input, not a byproduct of aim. This slowed down the pace of player movement and actions in the game considerably, but of course, the campaign wasn't updated or changed in any way to suit this, and so many levels were just too hard and, and unenjoyable. The lack of this key factor, of, of the game being designed and enemies and encounters being balanced for motion controls and their impacts on how they would change the way a player played the game, the lack of this broke Call of Duty 4's campaign. Yes, but its multiplayer survived. Why is that? Well, in pitting the game's players all against each other, the disadvantages they had in single player didn't matter because now they were all on the same playing field. Later Call of Duty games on the Wii and Wii U supported more traditional controllers as well, but COD 4's multiplayer was, and still is, it's actually still running, I'm not joking, but it was this magic sort of experience because it's one of very few first person shooter games that can exclusively be played amongst people using simulative motion control systems. In case you're interested in doing any extra research, because it's just something that really, really interests me, uh, the only few games like that before you know, the emergence of VR were uh, the Conduit and the Conduit 2, so the Conduit series, and this uh, this Metal Gear Solid 4 arcade cabinet that you played with like a VR goggle headset and you, you, you controlled it with your head and you had a, a gun also, it was really weird, but these were really the only games that I'm aware of at least that were multiplayer focused and only with, with, with motion controls, so uh, yeah, definitely uh, check those out if ever you're, you're interested in uh, looking into this some more. Now, as games have progressed, we've seen a massive decline in support for motion-controlled games and a massive increase in support for networked multiplayer. And as we know, correlation implies causation, so people would rather play against each other online than play with themselves, even if it's super realistic and feels like the real thing, if you catch my drift. Um, actually, maybe that's wrong. Motion controls haven't completely disappeared. In fact, when they are present, they're hella sicker than they used to be now that the whole industry has converged to gyros as the standard. So, finally, touching on the title of this actual video, in investigating the place motion controls have made for themselves in multiplayer games, we can see just how important it is that all three of those key factors are respected, that the complete set is present, at least you wind up with a crappy game that was better off without such a control setup. ARMS is a fun little fighting game for the Switch with a really well-made motion control system. Part a step up from Wii Sports Boxing, part its own unique gimmick. ARMS is a game full of charm and accessibility, as motion controls are used for launching and directing curved punches, as well as moving around the stage and blocking, while easy-to-reach buttons are used for dashes and jumps. Most everything about this fast-paced fighting game can be controlled via simulative actions. On a technical level, it totally works, and it's really impressive. It feels great making minute adjustments to your punches as your stretchy arms fly across as far as they can reach. It feels great shifting to block and, and breaking out to counter. It feels great affecting grabs from a long range by physically reaching out your arms towards the opponent. It's all really, really cool. The motion control system in this game is probably one of the best commercially available. But that doesn't mean that ARMS is a good motion-controlled game. See, as a fighting game, ARMS emphasizes multiplayer matchups and ranked fights. And when getting some experience in these, you realize that motion controls just aren't a feasible option when matched up against opponents who've chosen to use an alternate control scheme. The typical digital one, the controller. 
It may not have been the focus of the game's advertisements or box cover or splash screen, but ARM supports gamepad controls. You can play ARMS almost exactly the same with the controller, the only difference being that you can't curve punches independently of each other. That feature is only possible when using and reserved for detached Joy-Cons. But aside from that, the whole game plays the same. You move, you dodge, you block, you punch, and you grab. Except, and in exchange for one feature, you get the ability to greatly improve your input speed. I mean, there's no questioning the fact that it takes less time from thought to execution of any move when using just your thumbs and fingers rather than your whole forearms. In a game such as this, which when you boil it down is just rock, paper, scissors with timing, it's almost impossible to expect to be able to put up a fair fight when you're strapping real punches while your enemy's fingers are already hovering over their triggers. There's just, there's nothing you can do. You can't react fast enough to counteract enemy moves, and pulling off each of your own actions takes too much time and deliberation and thus is too easy for your enemy to counteract. Basically, the super fun, super sick way of playing ARMS doesn't give you a fighting chance against someone of the same skill level who's just mashing at their controller. Which is true self-reflectively also. No matter how good you can grow to be with the motion controls in ARMS, you'll always be better with the standard controller. Even if it weren't for the reaction time benefits, just the fact that your inputs are freaking deterministic sets your performance up a notch. Yeah, you know what? Gyro tilts and waggles are super cool and most of the time they work, but on the off chance they don't, they can ruin a game. ARMS is especially guilty of matching some actions to similar gestures that can be confused for one another in really wacky ways. So for instance, movement in motion control games is often hard to do, and more often than not just ends up being handled by a joystick attached to one of the motion controllers. ARMS doesn't do this, instead borrowing and extending a page from the book of Wii Boxing by making player movement linked to the rotation of the Joy-Cons. You shift them different directions in order to move those ways. It's okay. Problem. Say someone launches a punch at you and you'd like to switch directions quickly and then press the dodge button. Well, that might work, or it might not, because if you accidentally shake your controllers too hard while intending to change directions, the game might interpret that as a grab command, which is launched by thrusting both controllers at the same time. This can happen with blocks too. Moving too quickly to the block stance can easily be interpreted as a grab, or if done while moving, it can get picked up as a punch with one arm. So basically, for as cool and as fun as the motion controls are, they just can't possibly hold up against opponents who aren't using them, or even yourself without them. On a technical level, yes, they mostly work, but in the actual game, in the multiplayer ecosystem that it presents, they just don't fit and would have been better off omitted. If you've ever played a Mario Kart title from the Wii onwards, you probably know exactly what it's like. Yeah, motion controls are fun, but because the game pulls you with players who aren't using them, who are basically playing with a different set of rules than you, you kind of forfeit your success. You're just, you're at a disadvantage. The properties of the control system you're using are disadvantageous relative to other players. For instance, with motion controls, it's harder to stay straight, meaning you can lose some speed and get overtaken on straightaways. Ouch, call me a taxi fam. Now time to time, you might rank out on top. After all, Mario Kart is luck based. And when you do, letting everyone know that yes, you were using tilt controls, it's just this little added bonus, this little piece of honor. You get to know everyone's tilted, looking you saying, dang, that dude topped our charts and he waggled himself up there. But that's it. Nobody's thinking, hmm, maybe I should try those controls, maybe they'll give me a leg up. No, nobody's saying that because it's just, it's a fluke. Standard controls are always better. They give you more precision and take less effort, which need I remind you is a function of time to operate. Now, a clear way to fix this, which I've alluded to already, is to include filtered matchmaking that can strictly pair motion controlled players up together. These different modes of play, these different modes of control impose certain additional rules on players, so it's only fair to allow them a way to play against others in the same boat. In the example of COD 4, which forced this on everyone, players saw how the game's mechanics and systems were the perfect home for a different kind of game, a more slow-paced tactical team shooter. This only worked because everyone was sitting there pointing remotes at their screens. There wasn't a single rogue bumbo running around playing the game like a Twitch shooter. Everyone was slow, so it worked. If either ARMS or Mario Kart had some sort of option to only match you against players using motion controls, then they would make much better sense as an included feature. 
you'd think there'd be less people to matchmake against, but that's not true. As we've explored, the only reason there are so few players using these control schemes is because they're not viable against those who aren't. Right now, there's no safe space to even begin familiarizing yourself with these sorts of controls because you always get outpunched by someone else who's playing a much easier version of the same game. Providing a strict filtered mode like this though would give more players that opportunity to measure themselves against others more fairly, ensured that everyone is playing by the same rules. And on top of that, like, I know I've brought this up before, but like, just personally, I think there's something really cool about playing against others online knowing they're using motion controls too. In COD 4 on the Wii, everything that you do and that players do back to you is so much more personal because you know that someone on some couch somewhere had to physically move their bodies to do it. Every kill is someone aiming at you and pulling a trigger. Every leaning character is someone tilting their wrist to peek around corners. It's just, I feel like in a lot of multiplayer games it's easy to forget that each of your allies and opponents is another person with a life and enough money to pay for a system and a game and an internet connection. But when playing something like this, it brings you back to reality and you can really appreciate the skills of your competitors more. It's just, it's something else. It's something straight out of a sci-fi or something. So. Why am I really making this video? Is it not enough that I actually just really am totally interested in developments in motion controlled games? No, it's not. So a few months ago I'm checking the Switch store, hearts set on picking out a roguelike to play in transit, got a few flights planned for the next year. Boom, one stands out, Sky Rogue. A half arcade, half flight sim, all roguelike, and that trailer just blows me away. See, as a kid, I really liked Flight Sims a lot. I used to have this Star Wars one on PC where you played as a cargo delivery guy or something. I really liked the Rogue Squadron series, all the Factor 5 games, yeah. My one issue though was their structure. Like, I like flying, I like dogfighting, and I like commanding my wingmates, but what I don't like is having only three lives and being forced to restart these long drawn out missions again and again just to progress the story. Especially when the missions are already broken into chunks, like, the content is there, I just never felt like it was delivered in the right way. But suddenly I'm watching this trailer, and it's all clicking. Roguelike, that's it, that's what fighter pilot games are meant to be, that's how they should be structured, this is amazing. And then, oh and then, they show off the Danger Zone mode, holy crap, my jaw's on the floor. Danger Zone is a mode exclusive to the Switch that lets you control the game with the Joy-Con motion controllers. One controller mimics your flight stick, the other your throttle, and from the way they're showing it off, it looks like so much fun. Spoiler alert, I bought the game and decided that from the get-go, I don't even want to bother with the regular controls, I don't want to have anything to do with them, I only want to familiarize myself with the simulative setup and become a freaking ace pilot. Spoiler alert, I haven't bothered uh, with the motion controls since. Wanna guess why? Well, let's go over those three key factors to find out. Are the controls simulative? Yes. It feels so cool flying the plane like this. The cockpit view helps really seal that immersion in. Your flight stick in the game moves one to one with your Joy-Con, and the throttle sits neatly on the side and moves along with you also. You can see your actions and movements reflected in real time in the game. It, it's just, it's something else. Banking and turning and, and pushing full power and pulling up at the last second to avoid crashing, beaking around enemy fighters, using the triggers on the flight stick to fire weapons, oh my god, everything about this is fantastic. These are the most impressive casual flight sim controls I've ever seen. It's so seamless and natural, it's not even a question, this is simulative as hell. So how about customizable controls? Well, as far as the general motion goes, it's basically as good as you can ask for. I mean, flight games aren't really so input intensive. All you really need aside from buttons are your speed and pitch and yaw controls, which the pair of Joy-Cons is more than enough to handle. Those buttons though, well, I'd say they're not ideal, but really they're just not fair. For context, let's look at how it works when you're using the controller. You've got speed up and slow down as the two triggers. You've got buttons for firing, one for launching flares, stick clicks for rolls. You use the directional buttons to select a weapon from your loadout, of course, organized according to the D-pad. And you've got two buttons for toggling and locking the camera perspective onto a specific enemy target. This helps for pursuits and stuff, and you can also use the right stick to move the camera freely, independent of your flight controls, just to have a look around. Now, you can probably tell this is a fully loaded, this is an all dressed controller setup. Everything, everything on the controller is used, every button is necessary to play this game. Now, in removing the Joy-Cons, technically, you have the same amount of buttons available, right? Except, the way you're asked to hold it, it makes certain inputs inaccessible. So, playing with the motion controls, 
the first thing you notice is gone is the quick weapon select. The D-pad? Well, sadly, it's hidden under your throttle now, on the opposite side of your palm. So instead, the weapons are selected by pressing on one of the trigger buttons on the flight stick while the other one is used to fire. But wait, how are you going to select between four possible missile types with a single button? Easy! You're gonna, you're gonna cycle through them like a, like a freaking scrub. In the middle of breakneck dogfighting and tactical planning, asking a player to properly sift through and distinguish the correct weapon type amid a few others that are visually very similar, that's ridiculous. And, and, and that's without even considering that this is a game designed originally to have weapon selection be a single button press. Then you notice that your defensive and evasive moves are a little hard to reach too. If at least one was easy, sure, but both? It's hard to get to roll and to fire flares. This is kind of unacceptable, especially, again, considering this is a game originally designed for each of these to be a single button press. So what about camera controls? Well, free camera is still mapped to the stick, which sadly your whole hand is wrapped around. Forget manipulating that with your thumb. It's funny because if you try to, you'll likely accidentally tilt the controller to make it easier for you to reach the stick, but since this is motion controlled, you'll wind up, well, losing uh, your gas. It's funny because if you try to, you'll likely accidentally tilt the controller to make it easier to reach the stick, but since this is a motion controlled game, you'll wind up, well, losing control. You've got those perspective locking buttons again also, but as was the fate for the rest of these inputs, physically reaching those buttons is harder than they're worth. And it's not exactly related to motion controls, technically this happens in the normal game, but bombs? Right, so when you equip one you get this marker on the ground indicating where the bomb will land, but in that view you lose control of the plane and the camera locks to that perspective as if it were an enemy. It makes sense I guess, I don't want to shoot bombs upwards, right? I don't know. So this is a little jank, but you get used to it. Unless, of course, you're playing in cockpit view as you likely would for the sake of immersion when you're going a la motion control. When you do this, the camera still locks to the ground, but now the cockpit, or rather the whole plane, can be moved independently and twist and turn all around. Now you might say, well, you freaking idiot, don't do that then, to which I'd respond, but how the heck you want me to drop bombs on the ground? My own freaking airplane is blocking my view. So what you've got to do to actually see where you're dropping a bomb in first person is you've got to lock onto the ground, then you've got to flip your plane upside down via motion, so now basically your horizontal direction is reversed, and then, the plane upside down, camera right side up, you can drop your bomb. But watch out! As soon as you switch back to a regular weapon, the camera comes back to normal and suddenly you'll be upside freaking down and totally disorientate yourself. That? Okay. That is, and I don't use this word lightly, but that is caca. You know, it wouldn't be as disappointing if it weren't for the facts that this game is expertly crafted, it's super fun, and that the motion controls themselves are super responsive and, and excellent. It just, it's a shame that they don't work together, like at all. Unlike ARMS, where there's at least some sort of special ability reserved for motion, here you're only at a disadvantage compared to a controller. Also unlike ARMS though, this game isn't multiplayer, so does it matter? Well, see, the game, like we've said, was originally designed with a certain type of gameplay in mind. Danger Zone was closer to an afterthought than a requirement, at least from what I can gather. You can definitely understand the perspective of someone with a built, completed game suddenly having new tech thrown in their lap, building a quick prototype and going, dang dude, this is pretty gnarly, and then not really adapting the design of the challenges in the game to it. You can definitely get that. I can definitely get that. I mean, I've done this. I've put effort into features before that didn't work exactly as intended, but were super cool. And I've also pushed live, fully fleshed out features that have been scrapped. And I know that that sucks. I get what it's like to discover and build something really cool and want to demo it to people and share it with people even though it's not completely polished. And that's what bothers me a lot about this game and how it makes me feel. I mean, aside from the fact that you can fly out of bounds and under the ocean if you're a patient XQA tester type like myself, this is an extremely well made and polished package. It's a crazy fun game. It made me rethink fighter jet games as a whole and realize why I got tired of the ones I played as a kid. It's just this one feature which ultimately doesn't need to be there that kind of ruins it for me. Like, I honestly think I would have more respect for the game if it had been omitted. It doesn't need to be here. Even if it's just intended as an extra gimmick feature, it should have been reserved at that point for an extra gimmick mode. 
I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's some better way this could have been included. Maybe have a Danger Zone version of the game where enemies react slower or have fewer weapons and the HUD is transparent and maybe your weapon ranges are buffed a little bit. I mean, that's just some options to rebalance the handicaps of motion controls. But without those, the feature kind of just lasts until you die enough times to realize it's not a viable way to play when you have an easier and more accurate control option. So, uh, in case you didn't notice, the, uh, the, the third key factor, we, we just segued into it super smoothly and covered it. No, no need to make an awkward uh, flow-breaking announcement and transition to it, such as uh, the unnecessary one uh, we're, we're doing right now. So what am I trying to say? What am I what am I trying to say about freaking video games today? I'm trying to reiterate that for a motion controlled game to be good, it needs to have the complete set of the following key factors. Controls need to be simulative in nature, controls need to be as customizable as possible within reason, and the game's challenges need to be designed around the player's mode of interaction, i.e. them their motion controls. If a single one of these, most invisibly the third one, is neglected, such as the case with ARMS and Mario Kart, or overlooked, such as the case with Sky Rogue, then the quality of the experience of the player takes a hit. Ouch. I mean look, in the case of the last key factor, this is understandable. The first two are pretty easy to nail. This one though? Yow. Games are a living medium. Software is developed typically iteratively. Late stage requirements? Heck yeah, they're gonna bite. The trick is to make sure that they don't sink their teeth in at the expense of the player though. Look, if a feature is better off removed for the sake of consistent quality, I say do it. Give it some more thought, some more time to cook in the oven. Let it get good, and then, when it's ready, serve that boy to everyone. What am I trying to say? What, what am I trying to say about, about freaking video games today? I'm trying to say, and I've been trying to say for two videos now, that one really, really easy way to ensure that that most complex third key criteria is met is to replace designer-driven challenges with player-driven ones. Don't put a guy up against a bunch of high-performance AI opponents. Put them up against other players. Motion-controlled multiplayer is a fast track to ensure that the challenge is fair for all the players and that the super cool motion controls are a viable playstyle. Now, is that a costly feature? Yes. And doesn't it carry its own set of baggage like not exactly being the most accessible thing for all players? Yes. Should we care? Absolutely. I hope to actually cover that in a gimmicky future video. Hey, uh, subscribe to my Patriot so I can get a, a Windows VR headset and, uh, and not be judged by my whole family uh, for, sp for spending my own money on that. Uh, it's probably what's gonna happen anyways, I'm just gonna do it. But yeah, both of those. What am I trying to say? Oh yeah, I, I want a multiplayer focused, motion controlled only mode of Sky Rogue. That would be cool. That would be like game of the year every, every year for the next like, I don't know, maybe like one and a half years? But I mean... It's it's still really good. Uh, I'm I'm gonna go now. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go make a I'm gonna go make like a tree and Brexit. it. Sm smell you nerds later, fam. Peace. Hello and welcome to the sweaty end screen. Uh, let's get it started and let's get it done brief. First things first, uh, I will not be charging anyone on Patreon for this video. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. First one being that uh, if you are a patron or you're someone who's at least been following me for about a year, uh, and as I hinted at the beginning of this video, um, this video kind of started as its own original idea, but as it went on I realized that I was just kind of reformulating, uh, albeit in a better way, uh, topics that and subjects that I brought up in last year's video about motion controls. So I felt like it wasn't really fair to charge anybody for that because this it kind of just took on the same uh, purpose of that video with a tiny little thing at the end uh, added to it. So second being that I wanted to save time by not uh, reading out the list of names because there's something I actually do want to discuss uh, that I, I feel like I should before this video ends because there's one uh, stone left unturned so to speak. I'm sorry by the way if I sound weird or artificial in any way it's just that it's really sweaty turning off all the fans and everything because it's humid as heck here and I just kind of want to get this over with as fast as I can so you know let's just so Sky Rogue is evidently an independently developed game. As far as I can tell, the two people who work on it, one programmer, one artist. So um, independent games aren't really anything I've really ever covered in any of my videos. Uh, and I, I feel like 
it's a little bit more personal when you talk about something like that because you know really there's a higher likelihood that you will reach these people because they're not getting as much feedback as these big studios and maybe maybe they're more receptive to it because they're i don't know more closer to artists than they are just systems pumping out products you know and so when covering something like this i thought it would make some sense to actually try to reach out to somebody uh, on the team who made this uh this is the sort of thing i would want if people ever criticize me god knows people have criticized my work in various different ways and, and i feel like that's always the best way when you're somehow you know made aware of these things because tackling an independent developer in the wrong way with the wrong feedback and the wrong tone it doesn't do anybody any good. So at a point where I kind of knew where this video was going, I contacted the programmer uh, and I kind of laid out a, a full breakdown of the entire video uh, up to that point, which really nothing much changed. Uh, and I had some questions. I kind of wanted maybe the opportunity to, to clarify some of the things I was gonna say. I wanted to make sure that the assumptions I was making were grounded and I wanted to try to understand why certain things ended up the way they did in the final game. And originally he was really receptive. Uh, he did mention that he was pretty busy and he might not be able to respond uh, immediately, um, but it kind of got to a point where I realized he just wasn't going to after I uh, laid that out. It's very possibly my fault uh, the way I, I pr presented my questions and everything was a little bit unorthodox. but. Uh, very on brand. If, if I'm gonna do anything, I'm gonna do it right, you know? So all this to say, I'm not trying to throw any shade, I'm not trying to, you know, say anything. I'm not even mentioning this guy's name because evidently he, he didn't really, I mean, I, I did give him, uh, uh, I, I asked him some questions and I asked if he would like to be a part of this and he didn't respond. So obviously uh, he doesn't want to or didn't have the time to respond. I don't really know, that's, that's the thing. I just wanted to lay out the fact that I'm pooping a little bit hard on an independent game and I want to make clear that I didn't just do this in some little echo chain like I, I, I tried to reach out so uh, maybe this is a little bit awkward to mention in a video end screen like this but really it's the first time that I've, I've you know I, I felt like I was personally attacking somebody by criticizing their game when really I, I don't want it to come across as that I, I want to come across as someone with a lot of questions and I, I feel like I was hoping that just my background in, in software development would be enough to make sure that I touched this subject uh, appropriately and professionally, but I was still worried, so I did reach out to this guy. It turned out uh, he was Canadian too, so it was, you know, bonded over that, I guess. Not really, because, uh, you know, never wrote back. But I digress. That's really what I wanted to get across. Uh, I don't want someone to come out someday and say, this guy said all this crap and he didn't even make an effort like I, I did. That's all I want to say is that I did and I, I think that's, even though it failed this time, even though I didn't get any sort of response, I think that this, you know, contacting people on these smaller game projects that I may possibly look at in the future, I think that's a practice that I would like to keep up because um, I feel like it's a little bit garbage not to, especially coming from where I am because, I mean, Obviously, I look at games a little bit differently than some people. Like, I'll see something and I'll be like, like I can really, like, I relate to someone who, who is making these things and I'm always thinking about how did they develop these. Um, so it, it feels a little bit crap to just sit there and crap all over a game um, and not really give somebody a chance to, you know, make all these assumptions and drop all this stuff. And really, it's just easy to send a quick email or a video message or something to somebody and be like, yo, What's up? Can I just ask you some questions about your game? Like, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but I might accidentally. So please give me this opportunity to make myself, you know, a little bit smarter and uh, also give you the sort of feedback that you need based off your input. But uh, really, that's it. So, and that's that. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Again, for the reasons uh, stated, I won't be charging anybody, so please don't worry about that. I know this is, I wouldn't feel right um, charging anyone money for this video. But I hope that you you did appreciate all of the uh, all of the GoPro, well not the GoPro, but the, the action cam footage uh, I, I recorded for this video that I, I, the action camera that I purchased with, well not with necessarily, but I probably wouldn't have if it weren't for Patreon. I really like, I looked at it and was like, you know what, I, you know what, I, I can pay with pay, Patreon money, I can buy this camera. And you know what, I'm, I have some plans, I am going to drive this camera into the ground. You're going to see how much use I get out of this for these goofy video essays. It's going to be unbelievable. Stick with it. 
Anyways, uh, <laughs> thank you guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull the heck down now. I'm gonna do a little strip tease first. See y'all later. Oh, now you get to see all my rolls.